Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ayşe Bingöl Demir. I will be facilitating today's discussion together with Eylem. I am a human rights lawyer and co-director of Turkey Human Rights Litigation Support Project, TLCP. We are co-hosting today's event with Research Institute on Turkey. For those of you who are not familiar with TLCP's work, it's an organization established over two years ago and currently hosted by the Middlesex Univer University Faculty of Law. Its goal is supporting strategic litigation in Turkey to address the emerging human rights issues. Our team consists of leading academics, human rights lawyers, and researchers, researchers within Turkey and internationally. We carry out a range of activities, including litigation, research, advocacy, and capacity building in human rights. And the case of Osman Kavala was a case we submitted a third party intervention to jointly with Penn International when his application was still pending before the European Court of Human Rights. During our discussion today with our speakers and you, we will navigate through many questions, including who is Osman Kavala as a person, what he has been trying to achieve, why his case has been on the spotlight domestically and internationally, why he has been blatantly targeted by the government, and what is the picture behind, behind the scenes. But it is important to begin by indicating the obvious. Osman Kavala is a highly regarded civil society leader, human rights defender, philanthropist, and publisher who has a deep interest in culture and arts and he has been unjustly prosecuted, arrested, and imprisoned by the Turkish authorities since October 2017 for his legitimate activities. Two days ago marks his 19th day in detention for more than two and a half years behind bars, I, I should say. And as it is well known by this audience, his case, injustice he has been facing is not an isolated incident in today's Tur Turkey. In contrast, it is one of the most obvious examples of the trends in the country raising serious human rights issues. These issues include the human rights implications of closing civil society space, the repression of human rights defenders, and the arbitrary and expansive use of criminal law against them. This treatment of human rights defenders goes directly against the principles of the international human rights standards concerning this group. The principles which set out clear obligations of the states to safeguard and ensure an enabling environment for human rights defenders. In recent years, reports of international and regional human rights bodies indicate serious concern regarding attacks not only on human rights defenders, but also on journalists, politicians, lawyers, academics, and all sectors of the society who are expressing their dissent or critics towards the government in Turkey. Excessive use of pretrial detention and prosecution under baseless charges are described as instruments of judicial harassment. As a result of this policy, as we all know, there are currently thousands of people in prisons for their legitimate activities protected under international law. And with the current pandemic we are all facing today, more attention needs to be paid to Osman Kavala's and other political prisoners' situation. The Turkish government just passed a law to facilitate release of around 90,000 prisoners. And despite the persistent calls from the international community, the enacted law has purposely excluded political prisoners. Now Osman Kavala's continuing detention is not only unjust for the reasons set out in the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, his right to life and right to access to health care are at stake. With our discussion today, we hope that we will be able to address all these issues and maybe put together a roadmap together on what we need to do more as the international human rights community, cultural and art institutions, individuals, and organizations to address resist against these trends, and foremost, secure Osman Kavala's and all political prisoners' immediate release, 
amid COVID-19 pandemic. On that note, let me express again our pleasure to facilitate the discussion today with this distinguished panel of speakers and exceptional audience from all over the world and welcome you again. I now turn over Elan for her opening remarks. Thank you, Aisha. Um, thank you very much. My name is Eylem Delikanlı. I'm the co-founder and the director of the Research Institute on Turkey. Uh, we are a New York-based organization with an interdisciplinary um, group of researchers, artists, scientists, and activists who focus on human rights advocacy and creative public engagement projects around the issues of um, academic freedom, freedom of press, as well as collective memory and reconciliation. In the past five years since our inception, we organized several panels and conferences, engaged in network collaborations and built solidarity campaigns to raise awareness around major human rights issues in Turkey. On behalf of my colleagues at RIT, TLSP and Osman Kavala Solidarity Team, um, I would like to welcome uh, our almost 126 guests today uh, from several um, universities, institutes and organizations, including Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Article 19, Penn International, Goethe Institute, Kalus Gulbenkian Foundation, Crest Foundation, Para Museum, um, National Academies of Sciences, Human Rights Committee, International Commission of Jurists, Columbia Institute for the Study of Human Rights, Columbia Global Freedom of Expression, Freedom House, Bar Human Rights Committee, the Law Society of England and Wales, representatives from the German Parliament, German Foreign Ministry, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights of the Organization um, for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Council of Europe, Council General of Sweden, to name a few. We welcome members of the press from uh, Deutsche Welle, BBC, The Guardian, The Times, and the Süddeutsche Zeitung. We thank you all for joining us at this largest international panel in our groups um, uh, organized today on such a short notice and we hope that you are all in good health. Um, today marks the uh, 902nd day of Osman Kavala's imprisonment and not only did we gather here today to elaborate Kavala's case and the perplexing judicial process but also to highlight the solidarity events around his case. Um, how we can envision creative ways to strengthen collaborations and build stronger relationships to act together within this shrinking space, not only in Turkey, but also um, globally. As a starting point, we wanted to focus on um, the compilation, uh, I would like to show it to you, a book dedicated to Osman Kavala on his birthday on October 2nd, consisting of messages, texts, poems, and paintings from 300 of his friends, colleagues, and civil society figures. We will examine it as a way of building solidarity with Osman Kavala, with each other, and perhaps open a platform to exchange novel ideas to resist and fight against um, the attacks uh, from the authoritarian regimes around the world. Um, our, um, I'm sorry, we, we also would like this platform to enable us to share experiences that had positive impacts for our advocacy work, which we hope will lead to the, um, the freedom of Osman Kavala and all political prisoners, especially now amid pandemic. Our first speaker, Asena Günal, will elaborate the judicial process as well as the production of the book. Uh, Emma Sinclair Webb will share Kavala's case and the trial, as well as the new charges in relation to the European Court decision. She will also discuss the broader context of politicized trials, misuse of terrorism, and crimes against um, the state charges. Our third speaker, Murat Çelikan, will address how Osman Kavala's case impacts civil society in Turkey. And writer um, Nancy Krikorian will talk specifically about the work that she did with Osman Kavala around the planning for and the execution of the memorial commemoration of the centennial of the Armenian genocide on Istiklal Avenue on April 24th in 2015. We will then open the floor to our discussants for their brief comments and statements. Um, before I turn over the screen to our first speaker, I would like to briefly talk about the technical aspects of our meeting. We kindly ask you to keep your videos off and audios muted at all times. We as the moderators will be recording the session with the exception of the Q&A. 
an individual recording is not allowed. The chat feature um, will be closed during presentations, so you will only be able to direct your questions to the moderators. And chat feature will be open after the discussants share their brief statements and comments. We kindly ask you to write your questions together with your name and affiliation in the chat window for us to see. We will then read them and pose them to our speakers. Um, when I finish my remarks, you will uh, receive a second email with a backup Zoom link. If for any reason our session is interrupted or hacked, we will um, have to leave this room and ask you to use that link to reconnect to the session and continue. Also, this is a closed session. However, we expect the press uh, to report the event and write about it. And please feel free to address your questions as well. Um, now, I would um, like to uh, invite Asena Gunal to um, take the microphone and uh, please join me in welcoming her. I would like to briefly introduce her. Asena um, obtained her Bachelor's of Science in International Relations and MA in Sociology from the Middle East Technical University. She received her PhD from Boaz University in 2008 with a thesis uh, focusing on state citizen relations through healthcare policies in the Republican Turkey. She has worked as an editor at Iletişim Publishing House from 98 to 2005. And since September 2008, she has been working as the program coordinator um, of DIPO, a center at, of, for arts and culture in the Tophane neighborhood of Istanbul. Gunal is a co-founder of Siyah Band, a research platform that documents censorship cases in the arts in Turkey and was a fellow uh, of the Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability Program at Columbia University in 2014. She was a member of Socialist Feminist Collective and she has been working as Executive Director of Anadolu Kültür since March 2018. Her recent publications and editorial work includes A City That Remembers, Space and Memory from Taksim to Sultan Ahmed, uh, feminism in Turkey in the 90s, Never Again, an Apology in Coming to Terms with the Past, uh, co-edited with uh, Önder Özengi. And her articles, book reviews, and translations have been published on several platforms such as Toplum and Bilim, Bilim Birikim, Feminist Politika, Amargi, Express, and Virgül. Günal uh, is the 2019 German French Prize for Human Rights and Rule of Law Laureate. Welcome, Asena. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting, the Research Institute on Turkey, the Turkey Human Rights Litigation Support Project and the group of artists, and also everyone here who kindly accepted our invitation. I will give a summary presentation on the complicated legal process concerning Osman Kavala and then I want to talk about the activities which were planned and carried out together with artists and art workers who have been showing solidarity and raising awareness about Osman Kavala's predicament. It has been two and a half years since Osman Kavala's detention. On October 18, 2017, the day he was taken into custody, we all thought that probably they won't arrest him. And on November 1, when he was arrested, we said each other, probably they won't keep him for long. Last Saturday marked the 900th day of Osman Kavala's imprisonment. Following his detention, Osman Kavala was accused of various crimes by President Erdogan himself, as well as by media outlets close to him. The indictment about his case could only be officially put forward after 16 months. Perhaps the ruling power could not decide on how to frame him for a long while. In the end, he was accused for his alleged role in planning, financing, and organizing the Gezi Park protest, a 657-page long indictment seeking aggravated life imprisonment for 16 defendants, including Kabbalah, was accepted on March 4, 2019 by the Istanbul 30 Thai Criminal Court. The indictment was scandalous and did not make any attempt to discover a casual link between the alleged evidence cited and the heavy charges against him. The first hearing took place on June 24, 2019, 18 months after his arrest. Six hearings were held between June 2019 and February 2020. Each of the first three hearings had a different panel of presiding judges, which violates the principle of fair trial. 
all the hearings were like battles where the lawyers had to teach the basic principles of law and justice to a panel of judges and a public prosecutor. Throughout the process, the judiciary itself has been violating the laws at different levels, ranging from listening to a witness without the lawyer's presence to not applying the verdict of the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights announced its verdict on December 10 on Human Rights Day, which marks the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and has given a ruling of rights violation and demanded the immediate release of Osman Kavala. To delay the process, the local court dismissed the decision by saying it should be finalized after the application of the Ministry of Justice and used this unlawful excuse in two hearings. In the final hearing on February 18, 2020, the court ordered the acquittal of Osman Kavala and the others. We were not expecting this verdict since all of the demands submitted by the lawyers were rejected by the panel of judges and the atmosphere was quite tense. We were shocked, but at the same time, extremely happy. Family, friends and colleagues of Osman, as well as a group of journalists went off to wait for him at a recreational facility on the road to Silivri and others waited in town for his return. After several hours, we learned that there was a new arrest warrant for Osman Bey regarding the same investigation. The vehicle, which was going to bring him to his loved ones, went directly to police headquarters, and the day after, he was arrested again and sent back to Silivri. This was a total frustration. However, we were not so surprised as President Erdogan targeted Osman Kavala and Gizli in the party group meeting and accused the judges for attempting to acquit him with a maneuver. Can you hear me? I mean, is everything okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, because I thought like you're making a jest, but I didn't understand. Okay, sorry. So on November 1, 2017, Osman Kavala was arrested based on accusations of violating both Article 312 and Article 309. 312 is this, I mean, abolishing the government of the Republic of Turkey by use of force and violence, and Article 309, it's replacing or preventing the implementation of the constitutional order. So he was arrested from two articles. One was about Gezi, 312, and the other was about uh, coup attempt, uh, 15 July coup attempt. So he was given a release order for the case on 309 in October 2019. And based on recent changes in law of executions in Turkey, which limits the maximum pretrial detention period to two years, they could not extend his imprisonment from 309 and release him again on March 20, 2020. Besides, the verdict of the European Court of Human Rights was covering both Articles 309 and 312. So in order to circumvent the national law and the verdict of the European Court of Human Rights, he had to be arrested once again with some new accusation, and this time with more absurd one of espionage from Article 328. To note another strange fact in all these orders of arrest, Osman Kavala has never been questioned by a public prosecutor. Osman Kavala has long been a target due to his solidarity with the politicians, journalists, and academics whom the government tries to silence and his support for the non-governmental organizations working in the field of human rights and social rights, and the projects he carried out through Anadolu Kultur, which he founded with the aim of increasing the production and sharing of culture and artworks, emphasizing cultural diversity and cultural rights, supporting local initiatives and strengthening regional and international collaborations, and for spearheading the projects that establish dialogue with Armenia, Armenians, and create spaces for the Kurdish language and culture. He was a target because what he did demonstrated that all these could still be done. He symbolized the belief that there could still be law in this country. And exactly for this reason, his detention and arrest signified the criminalization of all these civilian and democratic activities and the persons and institutions that partake in them. By arresting him, the government wants to browbeat everyone who claims their rights and particularly those who work in the field of civil society and culture and arts. What befell Osman Kavala, who is one of the pioneers for the expansion of the cultural sphere in Turkey, 
made us vulnerable to attacks by police, judiciary, Ministry of Finance, and government-aligned media. About a year after Osman Kavala's detention, four members of the executive board and consultants of Anadolu Kultur, including me, were taken into custody with a raid at dawn. The oppression of the state was not limited to this. The Ministry of Finance launched an investigation of civil society organizations that received funding from the Open Society Foundation, which stopped its activities in Turkey after our detention. We went through in-depth audits and got a tax penalty based on a contrived allegation. And before this, Garanti Bank, a private bank, which we had been working with for almost 20 years, sweared its ties with us because our accounts were mentioned in the indictment. We are not the only ones facing these challenges. Today in Turkey, many NGOs have to contend with similar problems. Instead of focusing on their own projects, they are struggling against threats of closure, penalties, and intimidation tactics. NGOs, human rights organizations, funders, artists, art workers, and many people from Turkey and Europe have shown enormous solidarity. They were always in contact and never gave up or hesitated in working with us, supporting us. Yet, I should note that it is disheartening that in contrast to individuals from the field of arts and culture, arts institutions in Turkey have remained silent on the issue, showing once more the dependency of cultural institutions on both the state and capital in Turkey. Osman Kavala, in the past 20 years, generously invested in cultural field as the founder of Anadolu Kültür, Depo, and the Arbaker Art Center, and also supported and collaborated with other cultural institutions, initiatives in Turkey and abroad. From very early on, individual artists and art workers were in solidarity with him. Group of artists went to Silivri prison eight times for demonstrations outside the facility, opening banners, taking group photos with banners, flying kites. During the ninth Witch Human Rights Film Festival, a panel titled Filmmakers Talk About Osman Kavala was organized. In February 2018, an event of open workshop in shift for four days was held at Depo. The artist transformed Depo into an open studio space, produced work in continuous shifts of two hours while creating a hub for coming together. At this event, which was held around the 100th day of Osman Kavala's imprisonment, participating artists performed and installed works, read texts, and screened films. A version of Vardia was also organized in Berlin in February 2018 at Apartment Project. On the 300 and 500 days, the artists came together to have group photos and distributed them in media to call attention for Osman Kavala's extended imprisonment. They sent New Year's messages and birthday wishes to him with number of photo gatherings in the past two and a half years. Many artists and people working at cultural fields unwaveringly attended all six hearings at the courtroom in Silivri. There's a campaign group of cultural workers which was formed early on and mostly communicating through WhatsApp to discuss and plan activities around the coast. The group was instrumental in organizing the activities and events of solidarity, as well as producing creative visibility in social media. They voluntarily shared the images, videos, slogans, etc., with the people who run osmankavala.org and free Osman Kavala social media accounts at Anadolu Kultur. One campaign that made the most notable impression was attending major opening events of Artar Art Center and Istanbul Biennial in September 2019, carrying out tote bags, wearing t-shirts with imprinted stencils of Osman Kavala portraits and messages. They were supported by applauding guests of the event and received coverage both in local and international media. One day while chatting with director Didan Pekun, we came up with the idea of putting together a book for Osman Kavala's second birthday that he would have in prison. Didan Pekun is a friend and artist in the campaign group who previously collaborated with Osman Bey in various documentary projects and who misses him dearly like many of us. Neither Didam nor I could have foreseen that this idea would turn into something this big and emotionally challenging. Didam carried out almost all correspondence with the contributors and at some point she told me that it felt as if she was running a Osman Kavala helpline. Everyone was sharing their Osman Kavala memories telling how sad they were, 
and felt guilty for not being able to write to him. We contacted exchange messages with over 300 people, some of whom are here at this Zoom meeting. And this compilation, this book emerged as a gift. It came out as a lasting piece with the invaluable help of Banu Cennetoğlu, Salih Gürkan Çakar and Sevim Sanjaktar, who joined Didem and me in the process. Friends of Osman Kavala from his early years in high school and university, artists, writers, many figures from civil society, academia and the media contributed in the content with letters, texts, poems, and images. Materials from Turkey and abroad is brought together with a design that made the output very similar to an artistic publication. Osman Bey profoundly appreciated the gift book and it's possible to understand the extent of it in his thank you message to all of the contributors. I quote, I read it a number of times. I tried to read through the drawings, photographs, and paintings. The more I read, the more I taught and realized how meaningful each one of them are for me. What is produced is extraordinary. It enabled me to forget I'm in prison and helped me enter my 63rd year happily. This is a book that will make me happy to revisit not only during my birthday, but for the rest of my life. I'm grateful to everyone who contributed with texts, poems, paintings, and photographs. I'm sure you're all curious about the situation of Osman Bey in times of COVID-19. As they canceled the visits of the family and friends, we cannot see him now. The lawyers are allowed to see and talk to him behind the glass. Every week, one lawyer visits him and informs us on his condition. He is allowed to call his family once a week for 20 minutes. It was 10 minutes before. As there is no significant change in his day-to-day -day life, except canceled visits, he says that he watches what is going on outside as if it is in a film. He never complains, probably not to make us anxious, but we are concerned as he is within this higher risk age group and the prisons generally are not safe in terms of hygienic conditions and certain basic rights such as the right to nutrition and the right to health are not precisely looked after. The parliament has just approved a new law that would reduce the prison population by nearly a third. Last week, the release of about 90,000 inmates has begun. The legislation excluded tens of thousands of political prisoners, including Osman Kavala. Those convicted in unfair trials under Turkey's overly broad anti-terrorism laws are also now condemned to face the prospect of infection from this deadly disease. Whereas the constitution and international conventions oblige the state to protect rights to life and health. Normally, detention is considered as an exceptional preventive measure in the criminal procedure code, but it is often used as a punishment mechanism. And in times of a pandemic, such prosecution puts rights defenders' right to life at risk. Despite all sorts of injustice and adversity against him, Osman Bey never gives up on his kindness and without prioritizing his own situation, keeps on drawing attention to importance of judicial independence and rule of law. Although he is being held as hostage for exactly two and a half years with baseless, unjust and absurd reasons, he continues to fight for the ideas he believes in wholeheartedly. Even from the prison, he stays engaged and works together with us and keeps on doing good deeds. I truly wish that he will soon be free and this injustice will come to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asena. Um, I would like to briefly share a message that we received from Osman Kavala's lawyer, Ikan Koyuncu, and I am um, going to read it for our audience. I have learned about the digital conference taking place this evening from my lawyer. I deeply thank all the participants and the speakers. Unfortunately, there is a collective effort to continue my detention. Meanwhile, the mentality and the practices that instrumentalize my detention also continue. Together with me, there are local administrators, mayors and journalists who lost their freedom through these unjust imprisonments. Despite all, I believe the ones who defend human rights, law and freedom will change this dark tableau. I wish all the participants healthy days. Osman. Thank you. Ayşe, it's you. Thank you, Elam, and thank you, Asena, for this detailed presentation on how the legal process has been carried out against Osman Kavala 
and how busy you have been as Osman Kavala's friends and colleagues with the valuable campaigns you have been organized to give voice to the demands for his release. Uh, our ne next speaker is Emma Sinclair Webb. Uh, Emma is a well-known figure to the human rights community in Turkey and globally. She is Turkey director with the Europe and Central Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Uh, the organization she joined in 2007. She has worked on issues including police violence, accountability for enforced disappearances and killings by state perpetrators, the misuse of terror laws and arbitrary detention. She was researcher on Turkey for Amnesty International from 2003 and 7, and previously worked in publishing as a commissioning editor on book, books on history, culture, and politics in the Middle East and Southeast Europe. She has degrees from Cambridge University and Birkbeck College London and speaks Turkish. Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to really thank you for organizing this uh, digital conference. Um, uh, thanks very much to the Litigation Project and to the Research Institute on Turkey. Um, and I, I will really take up from, uh, I, I will not repeat what uh, Asana uh, described about the case, but I will sort of talk about some points. Um, and I, I first of all want to say that uh, back in 2017, um, it was a very difficult year because uh, several of our friends uh, in that summer were detained uh, on an island off Istanbul, Büyükada, uh, where they participated in a human rights education uh, program, um, which was all about uh, holistic security, digital security, but also uh, how to sustain human rights work in difficult times. Uh, and at that, uh, at that, uh, that meeting on Bugada, um, while they were in the middle of the meeting, the, the place was raided by the police and they were detained. Uh, and they stayed in prison for a number of months. Um, and in that summer, um, I, uh, like many others, um, really thought seriously about uh, the safety of other defenders in that time. And, several, and I left um, Istanbul in that summer for a few weeks because my organization, Human Rights Watch, um, thought that, you know, there would be a wider roundup of people um, uh, after those arrests. So it was a very um, tense period for all of us. And then I came back to Istanbul at the end of the summer um, and in September 2017, I, I met up with Osman um, and I hadn't seen him for some time and we sat and had a, a coffee and he said his first words to me were, and I'll never forget this, he said, so why haven't they gone after you? And then I said to him, well, why haven't they gone after you as well? Um, and little did we know at that point that just weeks later, um, Osman would be arrested and, and has been held in prison ever since. Uh, so I really uh, often look back at that moment uh, as the last time I saw him before uh, this horrible period of imprisonment and this awful trial that he's been through. Uh, and literally that was the last time I saw him, but I've reflected on it many, many times over the last few years, as you can imagine. Um, I think then I want to flash forward to these six hearings that we saw of his case, um, which were, I think, among the most uh, awful trial hearings I've ever been to in Turkey. Um, they were really a display of cruelty, uh, very, very combative, uh, very unpleasant for the lawyers, uh, for those watching, and for Osman himself and the other defendants. And the, the image I have in mind uh, when I think about those hearings is of Osman being led out from uh, a sort of tunnel, as it seemed to me. He would come, be brought up some steps into the huge courtroom, a massive courtroom, 
and he would be led by guards, usually young guards, who were gendarmerie. Um, and Osman, of course, is very tall, and he would tower above them. Uh, and this very dignified, tall, uh, slim figure of Osman is uh, really, I think, imprinted on um, our, many of our minds, uh, of those listening to this call. Um, it's something you can really picture when you think back to the case. These scenes of him being led in and out from this, what I felt was a kind of tunnel. Uh, it was actually probably a cell downstairs uh, underneath this building where uh, all the defendants um, who are in remand detention are, are kept and Osman was there, brought out and then led back again. Uh, and each time he was brought into court and each time he was taken out of court, people would clap. Uh, and wave and strain to see him. And he would give a very dignified, calm uh, wave back. Uh, uh, and it was a very moving time for all of us, I think. Um, at one of the hearings, we were told that we must never ever wave and mustn't clap and that anyone who did so would be uh, kicked out of the courtroom and could be arrested. Uh, and that was one of the, um, the heads of the court who took over after a few hearings uh, took a very hard line on this to prevent it. Um, so the, in this, this, this vast space, you know, the lawyers had uh, an incredible struggle to defend their client, to defend the others in the trial, in the Gezi trial. Um, and it, it was really a very brutal process, as I said. Um, I think after all of that uh, show of kind of constructed cruelty, really, um, you know, we were all ready for the absolute worst um, outcome of that trial. Um, because the court seemed to be staging, uh, providing a kind of performance of Osman Kavala's guilt. And how they would do this is do things like have a slideshow of images of burnt out police cars, of the, the most violent aspects or, or violent moments from the Gezi protests, which were absolutely nothing to do with any of the defendants, uh, nothing to do with Osman Kavala. Uh, and they would, while Osman Kavala was talking at one stage, we had this, the court would show these images and it was extraordinary, these images as if to establish his guilt all the time. This is the man who was responsible for all this. Uh, was the message. So you can imagine then that after this very cruel and sadistic uh, uh, performance at each of these hearings, people were all ready for the worst. And then came this astonishing decision at a very unpleasant hearing. The last hearing on the 18th of February was uh, one of the worst as well. This astonishing decision of acquittal suddenly came. Um, and I remember somebody very close to Osman uh, saying to me, um, it's as if they want to uh, subject to you to incredible uh, injury repeatedly. And then when it's over, you're supposed to be grateful that the injury is now over and you're supposed to be um, glad and, and happy. But of course it feels, you feel so wounded uh, by this process. Um, so I do think it's important, though, I, you know, to bring back in this very human aspect to these whole proceedings and how extremely uh, tough they have been on all of those closest to Osman Kavala, uh, those who work with him, his wife, Aisha, and other family members, uh, his cousin, uh, and people like Asana who work so closely with Osman. Um, and then I think the horrible cruelty continued with this second round um, that where they decided to switch over to the 15th of July coup attempt charge. Um, and we have this um, extraordinary switch where he got released on one of the charges, the, the, the charge relating to removal of the constitutional order. That's charge um, that's um, in the Turkish Penal Code 309. Uh, but then they had up their sleeve another trick 
And that other trick was to change the charge into an espionage charge and to, to accuse Osman Kabbalah of, again, in relation to the uh, 15th of July coup attempt, um, a uh, espionage. Um, so the use of this article 328 uh, in the penal code it has actually increased in Turkey recently. I've seen this charge being applied more often than it used to be. Um, and this is the grounds on which, as Asna said, Osman is currently held in prison. Uh, it was clearly an attempt to evade the European court ruling um, because Osman Kavala had been detained originally back in uh, 2017, October 2017, on two charges. One was uh, in relation to the Gezi protests, the overthrowing, the attempt to overthrow the government or prevent it in its duties. And the second was in relation to the 15th of July coup attempt, uh, the removal of the constitutional order charge. Now, I think by changing the charge to espionage, I don't think uh, actually, Turkey is succeeding in evading the European Court of Human Rights uh, decision on Kabbalah's case. Uh, and the Euro European Court of Human Rights, remember, has called for Osman Kabbalah to be released immediately on the grounds that uh, basically his detention um, was carried out uh, as an abuse of power. Um, it, it abused um, the the rights in the European Convention, uh, and it was conducted, it was carried out for ulterior purposes of silencing him as a human rights defender, preventing him in his work. Um, and, and therefore, uh, when the European Court of Human Rights gave that decision, it wasn't thinking of particular um, charges like whether it's 309 through 12, it was thinking of uh, the evidence presented uh, to detain Osman Kabbalah uh, in terms of whether he'd been involved, you know, the convincing, the, the credibility of the evidence in relation to uh, the Gezi protests and uh, the 15th of July coup attempt. And so just by changing the, car, the charge, but also referring again to the, the 15th of July coup attempt, I don't think, in fact, um, uh, that... Turkey is able to actually sidestep the European Court of Human Rights ruling. And there are lawyers in the room today uh, and others who may want to comment on this in particular, may perhaps Osman's own lawyer, I think uh, may be here as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw that thought in. Um, and I think now what, what is happening now is that we will have to follow up uh, at, uh, with the Council of Europe um, or around the execution of judgments department of the Council of Europe, because now that the, there is a, a European Court of Human Rights ruling, a very clear ruling or uh, judgment on Osman's case, um, the, the very great, uh, the important next step will be to try to get the Council of Ministers to uh, talk about the implementation of that ruling and to put the uh, process on an enhanced uh, procedure, which means that they'll take it doubly seriously and they'll really uh, hopefully read the riot act to Turkey over this ruling uh, and not just let it be yet another unimplemented ruling um, of the European Court. Uh, and, un and unfortunately, Turkey is very good at not implementing uh, European Court rulings anyway, uh, we, as, as many of you know. Um, so I think in terms of future uh, work and advocacy for us, it will be raising this at the Council of Europe level. Amnesty um, are planning to draft um, a, a submission on this, which I hope that we will also join and contribute to with them. So it will be a, a joint uh, project, I hope, um, at the Council of Europe level. Um, but I then want to just take a step if I have a few more minutes, to take a step back and say that, you know, of course, Osman Kabbalah's trial is part of a whole wave of unfair trials in Turkey. Um, courts in Turkey are under deep political control. 
We see this particularly, I think, uh, illustrated in the case of the, uh, against uh, the politician Selatin Demirtas, who also got um, a very strong ruling from the European Court saying that he should be released, that again, like Osman Kavala, he too is being arbitrarily detained and held, and the detention of Demirtas also pursues an ulterior motive of uh, restricting his activities as a politician and is an obstacle to uh, democracy in Turkey. Holding uh, an opposition politician uh, in, in that way is, is actually um, undermines uh, Turkey's democratic trajectory very fundamentally. So the Demirtas ruling also needs to be uh, implemented, but Demirtas's ruling, we're now waiting for another uh, episode, another um, a final ruling on that from the Grand Chamber which heard the case back in September. And so I hope that, that will come in the next few months. Uh, but that builds our case very strongly, these two strong rulings that Turkey is pursuing uh, politicized trials, that the government has control over the courts, and that there is no uh, domestic remedy in Turkey uh, in, through the courts, because the courts are, are fundamentally under political control when it comes to the trials of uh, perceived government opponents and critics. Um, so those, those, those strong rulings are there for us to work with. Um, I just want to say that uh, there is an intersection of several issues here. Um, we obviously have huge media censorship in Turkey uh, and many plans that we've seen in just the past few weeks to pursue that censorship. Um, Tempting, and I think they will try to do this in the near future, they will try to um, restrict social media uh, much more strongly than they are at present. Uh, they've, they've already tabled a draft law, which they then withdrew, the government withdrew, which is all about the control of social media companies. Um, I won't go into all the detail, but it spells a very, very dark turn where uh, social media it will be under heavy restrictions and lots of material will be taken off social media if it's allowed to go ahead, this law. And if the social media companies like Twitter and Facebook themselves comply with what Turkey wants to do. So we've got a very Emma, media under strong control. Emma, I should wrap up. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but if you yes. could, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Please go ahead to share your comments. No, no, I, I think, I mean, I, there's many points to return to, but I've just said one more sentence. Um, you know, Osman Kavala has made uh, an incredible contribution to civil society in Turkey. Uh, he's an incredible bridge builder. He's a man who has talked to many people um, outside his social circles. And, and I think uh, that is why he has, be, has been regarded as a threat because he's been prepared to bridge, uh, build bridges with different parts of the society to reach out and to really uh, look for uh, a better Turkey in which the rule of law uh, and justice are respected and in which uh, strong efforts are made to face the past and deal with uh, Turkey's very, very troubling uh, history. Thank you very much, Emma. Um... It was, um, it was an excellent overview of the situation in Turkey and specifically a uh, very detailed um, uh, account of, uh, of the real situation on the ground also. And uh, in terms of what you said about the European Court of Human Rights judgment on Osman Kavala and also Selatin Demirtas, I think that the Council of Europe's execution of judgment department right now is not that comfortable to get involved because uh, the, the judgments are unfortunately not final yet and their mandate uh, starts at that point. But it doesn't mean that Turkey's obligation to implement those judgments cease to exist. Uh, on that note, I would like to I, I would like to now turn the screen to our next speaker, Murat Celikan. 
uh, like Emma, Murat is a prominent member of human rights community in Turkey and beyond. He has been working as a journalist for the past 35 years in various positions as re reporter, editor, columnist, and chief executive editor. Celikan has been an active member of the human rights movement. He was a founding member and has been on the boards of the Human Rights Association, Helsinki Citizens Assembly, Amnesty International, uh, and Human Rights Foundation. He has worked on projects related to the Kurdish problem and media ethics, freedom of speech and assembly, refugees, identity politics, and peace. Celikan is a graduate of Middle East Technical University. He is currently the co-director of Hafsa Merkezi in Istanbul. He is also the producer of two feature films and the documentary Buka Barane. He has received the Civil Rights Defender of the Year 2018 Award and the 2018 International Ranting Award. Murat, you have personally been targeted by the government with the similar judicial, judicial machinery and have been focusing on many of these issues for a long time. In your view, what impact such practices have on the ground? What are your reflections on the effects of these trends, more particularly Osman Kavala's case on human rights advocacy and civil society in Turkey? Well, thank you very much for the presentation and for organizing this event. I would like to thank the organizers and also the participants. Uh, we, we can't have this, this many participants when we have a live event eventually, but this is better, I think. So more people are participating in events of this sort. Well, um, it had a huge impact. As Emma uh, outlined, we had uh, two important cases, by which the first is the Bukada case against members of several organizations, uh, human rights organizations. And the second one is the Gezi case, which Osman Kavala is the uh, central figure uh, in the indictment. Uh, these two uh, indictments and trials uh, are important in the sense that it's the first time that uh, with indictments and judicially, not only one, but several organizations are being attacked at the same time. So this had uh, a huge impact on the civil society, first of all. Secondly, now uh, Osman uh, is re-arrested for, for espionage and conspiracy against the Turkish government. What sort of conspiracy we don't know because we don't have an indictment yet. It's a new arrest. He has uh, an acquittal decision from the court, uh, a, a decision from the European Court of Human Rights saying that she, he should be released immediately, al although uh, not final uh, decision, and uh, that uh, accusations against him uh, should be suspended or uh, drawn back immediately because there is no ground for the accusations. And now we have a 90-page appeal by the prosecutor uh, against the decision of the court uh, which acquitted uh, all the members of the Gezi trial. And in that 90-page uh, appeal, uh, the prosecutor summarizes and reorganizes the indictment in a sense that George Soros, uh, Mr. Kavala, uh, Open Society Foundation, and Anadolu Kultur are at the center of it, uh, being responsible for organizing uh, all, uh, as said in the uh, appeal uh, during the Gezi trial, financing it and uh, trying to widespread it uh, throughout uh, Turkey. And the, the appeal and the, both the appeal and the indictment states that it's how the Open Society Foundation works. In order to, to overthrow an elected uh, government, what they do is uh, 
not use uh, terrorist activities, but they have to have, they try to have an appraisal with the messes they have organized by financing them. So they work in, and, and, and from the appeal again, Kavala is also involved in activities including women's rights, child rights, violence against women, the assimilation of minorities, freedom of speech, and environmental rights. So through these groups, they controlled, financed, and organized uh, all the Gezi events in which mm. uh, more than 3 million people uh, participated. So this is uh, the first thing, and this shows that the Open Society Fund that, that, that has funded more than a hundred organizations in Turkey up till now. Uh, now they're closed, uh, so they're not funding anyone in Turkey anymore. But when they were active, they have funded more than a hundred organizations. All of the, those organizations and are, are under suspicion and threat with the indictment and the new appeal. The second issue is the money issue. Osman is accused of uh, financing Gezi, receiving money from Open Society Foundation and using Anadolu culture uh, to, to finance all the Gezi uh, events. Uh, during the seven years in which the Open Society Foundation was active in Turkey, they received around 2 million Turkish liras in total from the foundation, which is with today's rate less than $300,000 uh, uh, in, in total. Of, of course, these were all uh, done openly because it's a foundation and uh, the, the foundations are uh, I mean, all of their account books and uh, assets and everything are controlled on a yearly basis. And th these were project foundations, and they claim that with the two million, Osman was able to uh, finance all the uh, Gezi events. That's, that puts also uh, under suspicion all the organizations were receiving funds from abroad. Uh, all the civil society organizations were receiving funds from abroad. And uh, the third, maybe main area is, uh, Osman tried uh, uh, to have the, an international reaction and contempt against the elected government. How he did it? Well, he did it with meeting several consulates, ambassadors, uh, members of parliament from uh, EU, uh, the European uh, Commission, the American uh, Council General in Istanbul, and by talking them uh, on the phone or meeting with them, well, that's what we all do as human rights uh, activists or civil society, uh, organizations because what we try to do is uh, document, demonstrate, um, do litigations, protests, uh, and reports on uh, violations, and we do it internationally because human rights uh, is something international. Uh, but by this, all of the meetings with, with foreigners held by uh, members of civil society uh, can be accused of treason against the government now. So the risk here is uh, all the civil society activities are being criminalized with an indictment in Osman's case and with the Gezi uh, trial. So his arrest and uh, the accusations against them is not only an agony for himself, for his family and friends, but also a threat to the civil society in general. 
And of course, this has a paralyzing effect on uh, NGOs in Turkey. Uh, as I have mentioned before, the indictment and the rationale of the prosecutor criminalizes all the civil society's regular normal activities, mm -hmm. peaceful activities. And um, all these means are described as violence against a state or violence to meetings, peaceful demonstrations, uh, peaceful uh, communications, uh, with uh, international bodies of uh, human rights, so on and so forth. So uh, this appeal uh, also <laughs> had a new dimension, uh, adding insult, let me say, to injury, claiming that uh, the Osman Kavala's so-called uh, civil society activities were in case planned to overthrow the government. So-called uh, is used uh, by state officials uh, in Turkey for this different issues. The most important one is the so-called Armenian genocide. Then we have the so-called Kurdish fighters or the so-called Kurdish movement. Now we have the so-called civil society activists or the so-called civil society activities, which shows us that with the two trials and with Osman's indictment, now it's time uh, for the civil society actors targeted by the government forces, because uh, it was first uh, the media uh, then the academia, now it's time for the civil society. So the most vocal parts of the society is, are being targeted uh, one by one, and Osman Kavalan's case is not only being used against him, but against the civil society, uh, because we don't know uh, who will be the next so-called civil society activist to be arrested or imprisoned so, thank you. Thank you very much, Murat, for these valuable um, details and information. And if you can please turn on your lights for the Q&A session, maybe we can see you better. Um, our uh, next speaker is Nancy Krikorian. Um, Nancy is a New York-based writer and organizer. She's the author of novels, uh, Zabel. Um, Dreams of Bread and Fire and All the Light There Was. Her poetry and essays have been widely published in literary journals and online magazines, and her fiction has been translated into Arabic, uh, Eastern Armenian, Danish, Dutch, French, Hebrew, German, and Turkish. She has taught at Barnard, Columbia, New York University, Rutgers, and Yale, as well as in New York City public schools and at the Palestine Writing Workshop as a fellow of Columbia's uh, Women Mobilizing Memory Project, she participated in coming to terms with gendered memories of genocide, war, and political repression. Public roundtables at Depo in Istanbul in September 2014. She was on the planning committee of Project 2015, which organized a mass fly-in of Armenians for the commemoration of the centennial of the Armenian genocide on April 24, 2015 in Istanbul. She is currently working on a novel set in an Armenian neighborhood of Beirut during the Lebanese Civil War. Welcome, Nancy. Floor is yours. Unmute. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the organizers and the participants and all the people who are tuning in around the world. Um, when I think of Osman Kavala, I remember the look of intelligence and attentiveness on his face as he listens to someone speak. He is a deep and interested listener. The other qualities that come to mind are his thoughtfulness and his gentle consideration. I have many friends and acquaintances, among them artists, photographers, filmmakers, musicians, poets, writers, and historians, who have been touched by Osman's generosity and kindness. Every one of them regards him as a friend. 
It is easier to be kind to those we consider our kith and our kin than it is to open one's mind and heart and purse to those who are outside of those circles, who may in fact be demonized and despised by the larger society. This requires special qualities. And perhaps these humane attributes are the very ones that have attracted the ire of the people who are intent on making Osman suffer. As the Soviet writer Vasily Grossman put it in his masterwork, Life and Fate, human history is not the battle of good struggling to overcome evil. It is a battle fought by a great evil struggling to crush a small kernel of human kindness. I met Osman in 2014 under the auspices of Project 2015, an international coalition planning a fly-in of Armenians to Istanbul for Armenian Genocide Centennial events. We decided that we wanted to devise a communal ritual as part of the commemorative gathering scheduled for Taksim Square on the afternoon of 24th of April. After considering a number of ideas, we settled on the Armenian wishing tree public art ritual, during which we would invite people to tie strips of fabric to a tree in homage to the victims and survivors of the Armenian genocide. Sacred trees, which date back to pagan times have a long and fascinating history. According to fifth century historian Moses of Horan, Anushavan Sosanver, grandson of the legendary Armenian king Ara the Beautiful, was dedicated to the cult of the plane trees at the sacred grove in Aramvir. Sosi is the Armenian word for plane tree and the word for rustling is Sosapyun. Anushavan's name, Sosanver, means dedicated to the plane tree and also evokes the rustling of the tree's leaves. Plane trees were planted in Armenian churchyards until the 10th to 13th centuries. Christian religious authorities discredited the, discredited the plane trees because of their relationship to pagan practices, but people still designated specific trees near holy sites as sacred. To this day, near many ancient churchyards and small roadside chapels, you can see a tree that is festooned with rags. Armenians go to tie a piece of cloth on these wishing trees. Each rag represents a wish or a prayer that the supplicant hopes will be granted by God. The wishing tree tradition is not restricted to Armenians. In addition to being venerated by other Anatolian peoples, including Yazidi Kurds, these sacred trees are found in places as far afield as Scotland and Japan. The idea of a wishing tree has been updated as a contemporary secular practice by people such as artist Yoko Ono, whose wish tree installation project was launched in 1996, with a recent iteration on display in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in the summer of 2010. In pursuing the idea, our team discussed what kind of tree we might use, a live potted one that could be wheeled in on a dolly, maybe a wooden sculpture made in the shape of a tree. These, they were modest proposals with small budgets. Osman, who was better placed in Istanbul, said he would arrange for the tree. His next move surpassed our expectations. Osman and Anadolu Kultur commissioned prominent contemporary artist Hale Tenger, whose work is known for its explorations of collective memory and of state power and violence, to create a metal sculpture that would provide the basis for the ritual. In the press advisory that we sent out in early April 2015, Osman said, after its inauguration in Taksim, we want our tree to have a life of its own and to travel to cities where there was an Armenian presence as a symbol of remembrance and reunion. On the afternoon of 24th of April, I arrived in front of the French consulate on Istiklal. The commemorative events were set to take place at this location because a permit for a Taksim gathering had been denied. Osman Halle and Halle were already standing near the sculpture. Anadolu culture staff had set up a small folding table on which 
were arrayed colorful ribbons and felt tip pens for people to use if they had not brought their own strips of cloth. I had printed my grandparents' names and their cities of origin on a waistband cut from one of my grandmother's old aprons. It was an honor to be invited to tie the first wish to Holly's beautiful sculpture. The whole day, which had started with a series of memorial actions around the city, had been emotionally draining. Since morning, I had been carrying a laminated studio photograph of my grandmother and her family from 1912. And now in my hands was a piece of calico fabric from her apron. Surrounded by friends who had come from around the world and with hundreds of people converging on the spot, I approached the sculpture. In that moment, I didn't hear the clamor around me. I was alone with the tree and with my wish which was not really a wish, but a gesture of homecoming. In tying the fabric to the tree, I returned my grandparents' names to a place that had tried to erase them from the land and from history. The physical gesture itself was personal and deeply moving. For this experience, I am forever grateful to Osman to Halle and to Anadolu culture. It was a time when we forged connections and stepped together through an open door. It makes me sad to think of it now, as that door seems to have closed and the hopes we shared have been thwarted. The wishing tree was displayed at depot, but political events prevented the tree from traveling as Osman had planned. In response to last year's invitation to contribute to Osman's birthday book, I thought about his kindness. I thought also about the cruelty being done to him, who has now been in prison for more than 900 days. I will close with the poem that I wrote for his book. Our Neighbors, for Osman Kavala. What are we supposed to say about those who put their children in a leaky boat? What about those who take to the streets with their shouts for freedom, justice, or some other notion? What should they expect but the tear gas, the truncheon, and the gun? We are sorry their children are suffering, but it's not our fault. We have no choice but to build a wall to keep them from ruining our city. We did nothing to them, so why can't they leave us alone? Evening comes. We let the curtain fall and step back from the window. Dinner is on the table. There is an old song on the radio, one that reminds us of our youth. Were people kinder then? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy, for this excellent conclusion of the first part of our, our event. Your personal reflections on Osman Kavala and his work will leave a lasting image in the minds and hearts of us all here. And now, before moving to Q&A, we would like to open the floor for short interventions from this, uh, several discussions. First of all, thanks to them for agreeing to contribute in the discussion today. Our first discussant is Mr. Nancho Sanchez Amor, who is a member of the European Parliament of the European Union from Spain, and he is currently the standing rapporteur for Turkey. The floor is yours, Mr. Sanchez Amor. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I, I don't know if, if my camera is, is on or not, but you are... Your okay, camera you are, is okay. off. If you okay, can... no problem, no problem, no problem at all, no problem at all. Well, thank you all, thank you all. My, the, there is an enormous difference in my position than from, from yours. I, I don't know personally to Osman, the most of you knows uh, Osman from, from several years. This is not my case, but Osman has become a very familiar 
name in, in, into my bureau and into my business dealing with Turkey because I, I don't know if likely or not uh, the, the Osman case has become a, a litmus test, uh, the real proof for the sincerity of the reforms in Turkey. I'm not, uh, I'm not quite, uh, I, I don't have a lot of hope given what happened in the last months, in the last years, every critical uh, figure or person or body in, in Turkey has been crushed after the, the coup attempt, has been the, the universal alibi to crush any critical aspect. In the case of Osman and Gesi, even there is a kind of a strange projection from the future to the past, because the rational uh, of the uh, 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 approach to the coup attempt on behalf of the Turkish uh, regime is has been extended to the past to guesses being completely different things with completely different routes and completely different actors but uh, they create a rational a narrative uh, around the coup attempt now they are projecting to the past and to guess the facts and to guess the events that are uh, of a completely uh, different nature. Uh, of course, when, I, when I, I have been in Turkey with some of you in the, in the last months, I have been asked frequently about if the European Union is going to evoke uh, Kavala's uh, case and other main cases in our reports and I say yes it's, it's clear because there are the there are the, the, the proofs there are the the most public uh, uh, proof that the, the the Turkish government and the Turkish judiciary without any kind of shame they are conducting the cases in a political way and and for that reason uh, Osman case and other Buyukada and uh, and other cases are going to be evoked in uh, our statement because the, the European Parliament, despite the, the situation, is still conducting uh, more or less uh, the, the, the agenda that we have for this year. And one of the main points of the agenda is the, is the report on Turkey. And for that reason, I just uh, want to encourage you all to continue your struggle. Uh, we are in different trends, but we are in the same battle. We are uh, fighting uh, for the Turkish society that deserve the best. I always try to differentiate a lot uh, between the country and the, and the government and the, and the ruling figures. And I always try to pass this message. Mr. Erdogan is not Turkey. And Turkey is not Mr. Erdogan, but you don't can imagine how difficult it is to pass this simple message all over Europe, because in Europe is everything, and every occasion is about what Mr. Varad says or think or, or have done. And for that reason, I just can commit myself to continue as a rapporteur trying to be not biased, the most neutral and the most objective observer out of what happened in, in Turkey. Um, I have been asked also about Kati Piri, my, my friend Kati Piri. Most of you know Kati Piri and I always say my Turkish interlocutors, uh, this is not about Kati or myself, this is not about Kati being Dutch or me being Spaniard, this is not the case, this is about you. Is Turkey performing better than in the past report or not. And I have to say, because I, I have said that publicly, there are no real improvements and nobody can expect from the report of the European Parliament uh, different opinions that are more or less the same opinions we deliver or Cathy delivered in, in his uh, excellent mandate in the past. Uh, well, for that reason, just I would like to pass my my gratitude to all of you. I pass my my best wishes to to uh, Miss uh, Kavala that I met in, in my last visit uh, in a very discreet way, and uh, just to to encourage you to continue your struggle because you have friends elsewhere. You have a lot of friends in Europe, and we are creating like you are doing with this uh, book. Uh, a massive uh, movement of support 
And I do really think that finally at the end, that kind of perseverance is going to conduct to any change in the behavior of the regime. I do really think so. Not just for us, because many other reasons, but I have some hopes and I do really want to, to see Turkey closer than the European Union, closer than these values. And for that reason, we have to support you who are our friends in, in, in Turkey. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanchez Amor. Uh, I think it's really important for all of us to hear what you just shared. Um, our next discussant is uh, Ms. Claudia Roth. Uh, she's the vice president of the German parliament, and she's a politician from the um, Green Party of Germany. Um, she was a member of the European Parliament and chair chairwoman of the Greens Germany. Her working areas include human rights, democracy, foreign policy, and she has been engaged in close relations to democratic forces in Turkey for decades. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for these emotional and moving moments we can share together with you all. I do think that this is an example for uh, an encouraging example, an inspiring, a hopeful example for global solidarity. And of course, I remember Osman Kavala as a very good old friend long before Gezi, a person which is really a bridge builder, like Emma said, a person of arts, of culture, dedicated uh, to democracy, a real European. And um, yes, he built the bridges in common projects together with uh, our foundation, with, uh, uh, with the Goethe Institute, with uh, Heinrich Böll Foundation, with the government, with others. Uh, also within, not only from Turkey to Europe, but also uh, to the European Union, pardon, Turkey is part of Europe. Uh, but uh, also within the Turkish society, when he built bridges to the Kurdish question, to the Armenian question, to all these uh, very important points. I remember him as a really very, very good friend and uh, common projects, but also wonderful dinners, be it in Berlin or in Istanbul. And the last time when I saw him, it was a day after the local elections in Istanbul, uh, in Silivri, and there was a kind of hopeful atmosphere, at least I, I felt it like this, but unfortunately um, the reality was different. Please let him know our warm greetings and our best uh, wishes. Even if he cannot hear it, he could or should feel that he is not alone, and we won't give up to ask for a free Osman Kavala. And please uh, give all the, our best wishes to his family, to his beloved, to the lawyers, and to the friends. I think that these 901 days, they make clear that Osman became the symbol, the symbol in a Turkey which is an authoritarian regime. But one cannot speak about the democracy anymore, um, where there is a systematic violation of democratic rules, of democratic rights, of democratic laws, a systematic attack against human rights. And Osman, he is the symbol for all this um, violation of international law, of freedom of arts, of the charter of uh, human rights of the Council of Europe, a symbol of all what is taken against democracy and freedom and uh, the attack against the civil society like uh, Murat said and Osman he stands as a symbol for all the others for Salah Hattin, for Ahmed Altan, for all the other good old friends and democrats. Our influence from abroad is obviously unfortunately limited but be sure we try to do our utmost and if more is possible from your point of view please let us know and if i speak about us i mean members of the german parliament i mean the foreign office andreas i think he's president uh, of germany i mean 
foundations like the Bell Foundation. I mean, artists like Shermin, I think also she's present. Please let us know what else could be done. What could be a politics which really is influential on, on Erdogan and his regime? I would like to know from you, and I'm a little bit concerned, or I'm really much concerned and afraid, that the corona crisis is even misused to make the situation even worse, for more repression, for more um, kind of deadly punishment against uh, people like Osman. Let me know, uh, please, is it true that this pan uh, uh, pan pandemic is misused even to make it worse the situation in, in your country? Murat said, uh, who will be the next? And he said, uh, it's a systematic attack now also on the civic society in your country. But once again, let me, let us know what could be done, what could help you, what could support you. And once again, thank you for this emotional being together in this old family of friends and human rights activists, not only in Turkey, but all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today and uh, for your warm uh, wishes and regards. Um, our next discussant is um, Professor Elazar Barkan. Um, Elazar, can you hear us? He is the Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, Director of CIPA's Human Rights and Humanitarian Policy Concentration, and Director of uh, Columbia's Institute for the Study of Human Rights, uh, as well as the Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability Program, of which um, Murat Asen and I are alumni. So let me just make sure Elazar is still here and can connect. Hello, everybody. First of all, I want to thank all of you for enabling us to take time out from our daily activities and to focus on Osman and his sacrifices. I have known Osman since, I think it was 2004, 2005. The first time we met, I believe, was in Yerevan in the 90th commemoration of the genocide. And I consider Osman a very dear friend. And I want to second what Claudia just said, that if there is anything else that we can do from an international perspective, I'm always ready, willing, and eager to do, do, to do that. My last meeting with Osman was in August 17. And in my naive way, I asked Osman, the Beaduka was just, the arrest was just made a couple of weeks earlier. Or that's actually in June, so it's a couple of months earlier. But I asked him, why doesn't he go away? It was clear to where it was going. And Osman didn't say that he doesn't know, that he doesn't think that it would go, would reach him. But he thought that his place is right there in Istanbul, in Turkey, in presenting the alternative and in presenting, putting his body on the line. I really left that meeting with heavy heart. It was, I didn't know when it will be, what it will be, but it was clear that it was coming. Our friendship overlapped with the declining of democracy globally. From the mid doubts from about 2005, democracy has been deteriorated in, around the globe. And in some ways it has reached the Western democracies as well. Now, with COVID-19, we have learned to reevaluate the concept of a hero. 
people who put their lives on the line in order to improve the situations of others, in order to support and to take care of people whom they don't know. And this has been a mantra or a, a mantra for Osman for much longer than I knew him, but we had met over the, these 15 years, 13 years that before he was in prison and discussed and tried to, to develop programs which will enhance the, the role of civil society. We have, co we have met frequently and I want to say that to my other friends on this, on this call, and those who are not on this call, Turkey was such a wonderful example for us when we started. I mean, when my involvement with Turkey began, and when and we looked at Turkey as such a symbol of a Muslim society that can support democracy before the Arab Spring, in the midst of international strife. And Osman was always optimistic. And as I hear from you, those who are visiting him, he remains so. And that is very encouraging, although it, it involves a, lot, a great deal of sadness. So I think that what you're all doing and meeting some of you in Berlin in eight, I think it was 1817 also, Murat, when you came out of prison for the weekend, I think all of you are deserving an enormous gratitude. And you exemplify the heroism of the modern era, of, the, of our current time. It's not clear how the society will emerge from such a destruction, from such an economic destruction. And we don't want to look back to Weimar to a, a period where populism and fascism in, took over as a result of social and economic depravity. So I see Osman was always leading with understated, with self-effacing, with gentleness, and he's always was putting himself out for everyone. So I am very grateful to be part, to, to take part in this meeting today. And I beg with you to keep me part of it and to see how we can try and help Osman and all of you, because it's the same thing. Osman is not just a symbol, he is a symbol, but he is a leader. And, we, and I would do whatever it takes if I can help him in any way. So thank you very much. And this is a new way of doing social activism. We are all learning very quickly. So for the 100 to 200 people who participate in it, I'm sure we'll all take a lot uh, with us and we'll continue to work to improve or to help Osman specifically but by committing ourselves to social activism and to human rights activism, I'm sure we are contributing to Osman's well-being, even when he's in prison. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Barkan. Uh, and our last discussion today is Ms. Sabina Sabolovic. She is a member of a curatorial collective called What, How, and For Whom from Zagreb and director of Kunsthalle Vienna. I hope I pronounce it fine. The floor, before giving floor to Sabine, Sab, uh, Sabina, I would like to let you know that we are up before, after Sabina, the Q&A will start. And we are now opening uh, the chat feature of Zoom so you can uh, put your questions uh, 
uh, type in your questions there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Uh, I'm sure I'm talking on behalf of so many people in culture, um, artists, curators, different kinds of initiatives that did projects which would in kind of never happen without Osman. Uh, our, my curatorial collective that I worked in is also one of those. Uh, we met Osman in 2008. We were curating uh, Istanbul Biennial and we just came to Vienna and uh, sorry just came to Istanbul and people who knew our work and that we are preparing an exhibition with a kind of a strong political uh, message and interest in the social and political um, uh, situation told us that there is someone we immediately have to meet this was really like in the first week of our arrival in Istanbul and I think I can share a joke within this uh, kind of small circle of friendly people that they basically told us, you have to meet the red boss of Istanbul. But it was not a boss whom we met, we met a comrade and a friend and someone with whom we really kept in touch uh, all these uh, years, but also someone without whom really uh, our Istanbul Biennial exhibition would never happen. And I, I just wanna, try to sketch a little bit what kind of involvements uh, you know you would get from Osman. So it was not only sharing his resources and enabling us to do an exhibition in Depot. It was also connecting us to artists that he thought were interesting, connecting us to so many intellectuals in Istanbul whose doors would probably be closed for us if it was not Osman who was uh, knocking on our behalf. Uh, he was also sharing his knowledge, his perspective, but he was also uh, in, 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 in that generous, in this sensitive way where uh, he would also notice that we are also at some moment getting tired, doubtful, was not easy working circumstances. And then Osman just rings you and invites you for a beautiful dinner uh, with fish uh, beside the sea or he invites you for a ride with a boat. So he was also always sensitive in which ways uh, support, exchange and inspiring each other um, is happening. Um, we were uh, keeping in touch also over a, a joint project we started uh, then. And it was a huge shock, of course, for many of us in arts and culture to hear about everything uh, that has been described uh, in, in, in uh, here and also something that all of us have been following. Uh, recently, uh, our collective uh, moved to Vienna. We started a new job there and we just opened our first exhibition in uh, a month ago. And in our entrance space, uh, beside the ticket area, there is a poster which says Free Osman Kavala. We managed to let Osman know about uh, new posts, about new projects happening, and he promised to come to visit. And I really want to end this brief talk with saying that I'm certain there are so many uh, artists, art spaces, cultural initiatives waiting eagerly for Osman to come be become part of them again. And he is in a way still part of them because so many of the things that we've shared are also in the ground of the things that we do now. And I really wanna thank everyone uh, who uh, really is resisting this becoming a normalized situation. This is some being something that we accept with silence. And I think exactly this kind of conversations, the amazing book that was produced, uh, artist initiatives, also artist creativity is something which is really important, important to continue in uh, awaiting what I'm sure is gonna happen. And this is Osman sharing all of this with us again. Thanks a lot to everyone. Thank you very much, Sabina, for this. Uh, wonderful um, intervention. I think we're gonna um, end the um, meeting here. Um, again, we are grateful to have facilitated the largest international panel with um, Turkey Litigation Support Project and Osman Kavala Solidarity Team. We would like to thank our distinguished speakers, uh, members of the press and our exceptional audience. 
Um, we hope that not only our colleague and dear friend Osman Kavala will be re released immediately, but all political prisoners will be free at once. Before we go, we would uh, like to ask you if you would like to join uh, to turn your cameras on and we can take a, a picture of the screen uh, with all of us together. And while doing that, I might also say a few things to close uh, our event. Uh, a big thank you to everyone, uh, starting from our speakers, our discussants, and every, everyone from all, all around the world who accepted to join us today for this event and for this very fruitful discussion. And also thanks to, to the team, uh, Research Institute on Turkey team, uh, my co-facilitator Alam and all friends and colleagues who supported us to make this event happen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. See you at the next event. <laughs>